So um, I am Ken. Uh, been involved with the project for some time, and um, so actually, I want this to be more of you know your session, where I'm not like giving information to you, but basically you are just interacting and maybe asking questions that probably you know, we haven't uh, answered somewhere, or maybe some ways to you like to see things or you know. So feel free to ask questions. They can be unrelated. It's fine. So what I'm going to uh, just mention is, um, you know, we have sometimes questions asked on IRC and you know things like that. And uh, there are a bunch of tools and practices that we have actually collected in Open Embedded that can be very efficient and very helpful. So, um, of course, there are tons of them. I'm not going to cover a whole lot. I'm probably going to cover maybe at max, you know, eight or ten. Uh, but feel free to share if you have some of your favorite things and you, know, you would like to do. And uh, while you have your VMs on, and maybe if you have built an image or <coughs> set up your environment, you could try some of those commands and you know, see whether they work for you. So with that, um, so there's a tool called Bitbake Lips. How many of you use it? Okay, so we have a few of them. So it's a very handy tool. And um, I'm told that our new auto builder is actually using this tool. So, you know, uh, as well to add layers. Um, and it's a very, um, uh, I think it's been a few years that this tool has been around. And uh, we make mistakes, you know, we manually added bbla.conf and try to do things. Um, this is a handy tool and you can automate it and things like that. So in your uh, Jenkins uh, scripts and all, when you're adding uh, layers, uh, deleting layers, you know, so uh, add new layers handy. In some cases, when you are debugging things, and I've seen this asked many times, where they say, "Well, my, I have a BB append and it doesn't fly." Um, so it's handy to use, like show appends, and it shows you um, what all appends are being applied. So if you have like complex uh, workspace setups, in some cases you do, where several BB appends are in play for the same recipe. Um, so this can be very handy to see whether you know, your BBA append is even entertained by the system. Uh, show recipes is is, uh, is very nice to look what's available in your workspace. Many times um, it's a quick way to see what you have. And then of course there's a layers.open that openlibrary.org where you can look for any recipe that may be available in the ecosystem. Um, and um, show layer shows you what all layers are there in your uh, workspace. So um, look at big Bitbag layers help and I think there are more things there but I encourage you to like explore this tool. It's a uh, quite a power tool that you could use. Um, to handle handy problems. We had a Yocto layer tool and we dropped it because there was no point to have a better tool when this one already had it. Mm -hmm. So is there a create layer option as well? Yes. Yes. Right. Yes. So I didn't do it because I think uh, you know a lot of stuff that I have here you know, is it's covered by some of the talks okay. as well. Um, I'm more from a developer focus, you know, what could be some of your toolbox that can be handy for you when you are doing your day to day stuff. Um, and, uh, and obviously, you know, there are other things that are available in the tool that might be relevant to you know, what you are doing. So, um, so, feel free if you want to try it out, you know, keep trying on your VMs, and I think uh, we should see some. Uh, information that I'm talking about here. So the next tool is Bitwake. What changed? Um, when you are on some, like, say, developing on master, right, and you do 
Git update or whatever, um, and things change. So um, you don't have an idea what might have changed underneath, and you know you are seeing a regression or something. Um, so this is pretty handy when there are changes from your last build to current build. It gives you a, a, a very effective output that you know can give you some hints into what might have gone wrong, or at least will narrow down the problem. Yeah. It's not like it does. It worked. It doesn't work. So it's somewhere in between that you can find out what might have changed. Um, and um, um, you could also look into build history and things like that. Uh, I'm not covering that here, but there are other ways to get the sim get similar information. Um, but uh, you know, this is one easy, handy way to see quickly what might have gone wrong. Um, I encourage you to uh, also make it as a generally used tool in your uh, sandbox. So um, we talked about that tool. I think we had an excellent talk and presentation. Hopefully you ran through the samples. And uh, what I'm going to say here in is, is in one slide, four steps. Uh, the workflow that I generally use um, when you are doing some, you know, development on top of existing workspace. So this is a day-to-day -day activity, right? So you are having a set workspace, you are developing one single package, uh, or making changes to it, writing patches to it. So, um, so these are like, you know, in nutshell, few steps that you would do. Um, that will modify, will create a workspace, so it's kind of your your drawer, so you have everything locked. You take one package out of the drawer, right, and then you make changes to it, um, and then you build it. You deploy it, test it out, um, and then you, when you say that will finish, it basically creates that patch, pushes it into the layer, and you are ready to commit it and maybe send a stream. So it's a very high level view. There is a lot that goes underneath and I think uh, I'm not gonna go into those details from workspace um, uh, from uh, the previous talks. I think you went through the whole process of creating a layer, making changes and then seeing in action. Um, so in generally using that tool to do your work, it's a pretty handy tool, you can't go wrong and uh, it generates consistent patches. You know, that's the very powerful thing is that it uses Git uh, underneath, and you know you have consistent patching. And overall, what you see is that your layers get more homogeneous over a period of time. So, uh, if in your company or you know in your work, I encourage your colleagues or whoever is working on this um, to use this as their you know uh, primary way of developing on top of uh, open Direct. Um, the next one, OE PKG data utility. How many of you have used it? It's a very handy tool. So um, I'm going to show you an example just to impress you. You know, so you start using it as well. Many times people ask this question, uh, at least at my work. Hey, who provides the, that particular binary? Or you know, which package it comes from? Or what's the lineage of it? Right? And one way is you go grab, find, and all that kind of stuff. Other way, we provide a more methodical way to look into metadata, and it will give you a lot of information. Um, so, uh, just I think this morning we were having a discussion. I think Marco was having a question about uh, uh, you know a specific a specific problem that uh, he was uh, trying to do. Um, he was having an error, right? So uh, we had uh, a message on there where he said uh, there's a package which is needing libqt web uh, GUI, I guess, and uh, it's not working, right? So if you're not on IRC, if you're on IRC, you might have read that. So um, I just use this tool you know, to help him. So I can just give you a, a kind of, 
Um, only if I can figure out how I can. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so what I did there was, um, if you look into uh, the messages, that's what was going on, and uh, I wanted to help him. So he was looking for, you know, which packet provides uh, uh, the the library, um, right? And then what I did here was I used the same tool. And uh, right, so there it goes. It tells me who provides this, right? So I don't have to go do grab and all those things. And then I asked him that, hey, why don't you add a uh, a runtime dependency on Qt base? And um, you know, so that probably would solve your problem. Um, so it's easy uh, to use, and it can give you a lot of information. So uh, if you see uh, in here, oh, come on. so um, so I showed one example, but you can see there are. Um, several other options, other handy um, options like um, list package files. Sometimes you want to know you are writing a package and whether it has all the content you need, right? And you, and you might be seeing that it's being um, shoveled into a different package. And uh, you want to inspect what's there in the final you know, RPM, IPK. You would be able to use that here handy and find out. And in some cases, you will be able to see just some package information. It shows you the version, which version it built, right? Um, and um, you can, uh, one of the very handy thing is when you have a recipe that builds many packages, right? And uh, you don't have association between who is providing this particular package or how it translates into recipe. So you could use lookup pkg command, for example. You have um, a way to get up um, into the recipe space and find that out. So those are handy tools that you know you can add to your uh, um, toolbox to be efficient when you are in your uh, uh, Yocto workspace. Um, so most of times. Uh, I think we covered a lot of things that uh, uh, we are going to talk about, but I think I'm going to stress on testing quite a bit. Um, and I'll show a few selective slides in a uh, couple of minutes. Uh, but I think right now we are at a point where we can make testing as part of our daily life in, in the other product. So, you know, we have to do it where we make it as our practice, then our patches get better, you know, the submissions get better. Uh, we churn a whole lot of auto builders, but uh, you know, if our patch quality grows up, then obviously you know, we become more agile and uh, you know, the patch acceptance process becomes faster. So, uh, um, so there's a whole lot of things that have happened in the testing area. And, uh, and a whole lot goes in auto builder, and I'm not sure that a lot of us uh, use the same practices, um, you know, on our own workspaces before we create our patches. Um, or otherwise, you can also use it in your own uh, automation systems if you want to scale it up. So, um, there are different kind of tasks we will uh, talk about. Um, primarily, you will see that uh, um, OE self-test is actually testing the metadata itself. It's a sanity test for itself. Um, 
and it might be testing you know how a particular tool runs how a particular procedure runs um, basically ensuring unit testing itself uh, right so say you write a new class to do something then you might want to write a base how to test it um, so that is what you use for um, and um, what you can see is there are existing tasks so even if you start exercising those it's a big advantage so you could um, just see with minus l option it will give you a whole list of tasks that are available and um, then there are other options if you can run all of them right so whenever you make metadata changes right it's good to run those and make sure that uh, the change you did isn't causing an issue in the metadata itself because most of the time you submit it and then auto builder fails and you know one of the maintainers comes back at you and you are wondering there oh what did they do right? it's not magic that they are doing they are running all these tools so if you ran them beforehand and there are chances that you know there will be no issues with the patch and will save some precious auto builder time so um, so you could also run um, the test selectively. So if you know that you made a change to recipes tool or you made a change to dev tool, and um, you don't want to run the whole sheet bank because it's going to take you, you know, uh, quite a bit of time to run it, you could just run a specific subset. So um, it's the tool, the class, you know, and then they a kind of a, um, the particular individual test that you would like to run. Um, so sometimes, you know, when I'm changing one of these PB classes, I keep running it again and again, just to make sure that my changes aren't regressive. Right? So I'll pick up one test right, that is most appropriate to this, the area I'm touching. And then I keep running that, so it makes it keeps my own sanity and keeps me going with you know the change I'm doing. At the same time, making sure that I'm not breaking things. Um, so uh, look at the other options. Uh, you know, most of it I'm giving you a kind of you know high level introduction, maybe a few things. Uh, but you know, you are. Um, Initiated into the Yakta project, and you already can then you know figure a way out and find out what are your path options in there. There's a uh, whole lot of this information on Wiki as well that's available. How to run self tests, how to add to them. Right. So when you change something and you know this is a new functionality, you know, you know you are in the best position as a developer to test it out or at least have a test case. Project. So I uh, highly encourage to add those uh, self tests as you develop it. So you know, whenever you make a change, add a feature or something to a tool, send it as long. Right. It's amazing. Um, so if you go through the wiki page, you will find there is a lot more information about OE self test. Um, it deals with the internals. If you want to learn more about it. Uh, you can learn more about it. Um, it also tells you how to add tests, right? So if you just want to be at that level where you just want to add tests, not deal with infra, that's fine too. It has a few steps there for you. Just, just add the test. Um, but those contributions highly, uh, highly in demand and you know very welcome. So like the number one thing you could do to help us. Yes, indeed. And I think the focus more and more as we mature on our metadata is going to be in this area because uh, we are going to focus a lot more on automation. And uh, the automation is as good as your tests eventually, right? So um, this will be like key uh, to have a very good quality automation. So uh, there is another uh, category of tests which is called image auto test. Um, so there are two kind of tests. You can run those manually, 
or you can run it automatically, which means if you're developing on emulator, right, you know, something like that, you could just do bit bake image, and after building the image, it will automatically run those tests, <coughs> run those tests, which means it's kind of your sanity tests, right? So you did some change, dev tool this, whatever, and then it will go and run those tests, whichever you have selected, on the whole image, automatically. C test image is actually, you are forcing it manually to run the tests. The reason for that is, um, I think I have a little bit of it. It's a, it's a vast topic, by the way, but um, so you might build the image and then manually flash it into SD card and then put it on a Raspberry Pi or whatever what you use, and then you initiate tests. Right? So um, that's when the, the manual step is handy. Um, when you're using emulator, just use auto test like, you know, and I've given here steps how you could do effective auto testing. Um, you can not, you can, it's not limited to emulator by the way, so you can like plug in your board to it, as long as it has network access. Uh, you could basically test it on a real board. I do that very often uh, where, you know, I build an image, add a bunch of p-tests, run them, uh, make sure that everything is same, is not regressing more. And uh, it helps me find a lot of issues, random issues actually, which is what you are after in the end. You know, in the end, you, those are the ones that's, that are gonna bite you there because build is one part of it. I think what Yaku project has so far done is taken that pain away from everyone. You know, uh, earlier people used to build and a week later they'll say, yeah, I'm able to build it. Now you check out the actor project, and three three hours later you have the build. Right. So this is this, the next step in our evolution. Um, so um, as you can see here, you can tell the IP of your board or IP of your server where you are building, where the tests are, and then uh, the test targets. So there is a lot more information on the the particular testing side of the things, there is more automation like you can uh, choose a particular type of boot system like system D boot and have an EFI based system which means you can download the full shebang like full image onto the board automatically, run the tests automatically and uh, stuff like that. But it's not available for all kind of boards yet because you know every board has different way of reading. Um, but there is a whole lot there. I think uh, explore more. You know, um, I just wanted you to be aware that there is this test infra that's available to you for your day-to-day -day work, and uh, uh, make sure you can learn that. So the third category is testing the SDK. Right? So we are building SDK, um, extended extensible SDK. Uh, team talked about it this morning. And then we have our general application SDK as well. Um, so there are targets uh, to test them. If you are shipping SDKs as platform guys to your application teams or others, we want to make sure that you know they are not regressing in any way. Um, these are very handy, um, you know, test targets that you could run when you are building those SDKs. And uh, some of those tests run for a lot longer because that tool, if you run the whole test free, takes probably hours. So it's very detailed testing that happens underneath. Um, so you could choose, uh, you know, what level of testing you want. Um, you know, I've given an example, minimal, like if you just want sanity, just run small tests, uh, make sure everything, not in the detail, but if out of box, it's not dead. Um, you could run more exhaustive testing as well. So, um, uh, I think I'll show you a bit later, let me finish it off here. But um, we have, uh, uh, I'm gonna show you like how um, extensive the tests are. In some cases, you have 
GCC test. What that does is it actually builds bundles of GCC on your device. And then it takes an example, right? So a sample downloads it, builds it on the target. Make sure that it builds, right? And, and you could do more, right? So it's that level of testing where, you know, on in a cross environment, when it's making sure that if you're shipping on device SDK, obviously GCC should work. Right? So it's making sure that all those um, tools are in place. And um, similarly, there are package testing, you know, that tests not only the make test target that comes with the package, but there are other system level tests that are done, like if you run SSH, then it's going to do extensive SSH uh, testing on the system, trying to get more and more. So again, I mean, the basic infra is there, more tests as we add, the better we get. Um, so highly recommended, um, you know, integrate that into your workflows, tell your colleagues, everyone, you know, test image is ready for prime time. So is test image auto and test SDK as well as testing the extensible SDK. So um, given that now you are able to test and, you know, uh, given that you are able to create patches, um, I'm going to touch base on some of the additional uh, how to send code upstream, right? So there are several ways you could do it. Um, and it's there in the manual. So if you look in manual, um, you know, there are a couple of different ways that you can send. You can create a pull request with Git. You could just do a Git format patch, send patch, you know, to the mailing list. Or we also provide some, um, some scripts. These scripts are actually helpful for you to create consistent pull requests. And uh, so I just wanted to introduce them. I mean, everybody has their own workflow when they create the, uh, when they want to send patches. Um, but maintainers do look at this. Their workflows are actually tuned to this. So if you want your patch to be considered, they don't have time, right? So they may look at mailing list. You might have to send two or three pings, and after that, he might get. You might have to annoy them enough uh, that they will look at your patch. But if you follow their workflow, chance of them pulling in your pull is very high, even if your patch may not be as important. Um, so it's a good way to facilitate your patches upstream. So I highly recommend to follow. You know. Uh, Carefully watch uh, what the maintainers are, are, are doing and are expecting you from you. Eventually, they'll get to your patch, but this will be a quicker way to get to them. Um, so, oh, yeah. So, I think um, the other way is um, you know, you could just uh, uh, send a patch. So, So uh, I just remembered while I'm here, I can just send a patch. Just uh, two, uh, two questions. Mm -hmm. On the pull request, uh, are we going to the mailing list only if it goes pull request for everything and uh, open and close things? Right? Yes, we are. Um, but um, as I mentioned before, uh, you know, um, so Ross, for example, drops the mailing list, right? Um, and then it goes through uh, his testing. And many times you'll see on mailing list, he says, oops, I didn't see it, or you know, I missed it. Right? So you have to remind him a couple of times. And before reminding, you might wait for a week because not to annoy him, right? Yes. So your patch just gets delayed because you know, there's zillions of emails that are flowing through our eyes and we might miss it. And I don't reply to, uh, I think I reply to a handful of emails because I just don't see many of them and I'm just honest. Um, so you have to, it's your responsibility to make sure that your patch gets noticed. Right? 
So um, this is help, helping you in that way. If you follow, follow this process, chance of you getting your patch is, is higher. Yeah. So yes, the patches are accepted on mailing list. Right? Patches are from pull requests. Um, and uh, But you need to find out which is the quickest way for you. So I'm just giving a hint. So the other thing, uh, like I use Seagate a lot, just the web interface to look at git.yakupavik.org, git.openjet.org, right? And so every day I'm just going into that a bunch of times a day. If you did a pocky contrib or an OE contrib, you know, branch, that's what's going to show up at the top of, of Seagate, which means if you created a functional branch in there, I'll know you created it, even though you haven't told anybody about it yet, and I'll go, hmm, that's interesting, what's in there? And then all of a sudden, I, I might start emailing you about something because you just hit something I'm very interested in. So you know, yeah. that's part of that flow that you're talking about. Right. So um, so this is, you know, I sent an email, uh, a patch uh, yesterday, and then, you know, I got a response saying that, you know, there's a better way of doing it. Right, so I did it. So um, and I've tested it already, and it works fantastic. So um, um, you could basically uh, send it, um, uh, you know, through this. Just do a git format patch, right? Minus one, and then you have this here. Uh, you have the patch, so you could just basically add a v2 to it because. Um, v1 is already out there and then another thing that you might want to do is uh, you know here after this um, add something like uh, you know changes since v1 and then explain what changed right um, or you can somehow provide the information what you have done what the changes are since different versions so you can keep adding to that ad as you send more and more versions so this helps people to see the, the genealogy of how patch has been evolving. In some cases, patches which go through iterations, and then more and more people get involved reviewing that patch. They are not in a position to look at those seven different iterations, right? So they will look at V8 of your patch, but then they can go through, oh, V1 was this, V2 was this. So they immediately get the context. So you want to attract them to answer to your patches. So make your patch, uh, you know, as concise and as informative as possible. So you could write uh, like this, changes since V1, V2, V3, however long, and then list the changes that you've done on top of the various revisions, right? Um, and then uh, you could do just a, uh, you know, a git send email, right? And then minus two, and then just send the email uh, and it will show up there and done. Uh, the other way is that you use, um, you know, create pull request, right? Um, and then uh, you can specify a contrib repo, which I have set up, right? I think there's a whole detail on that one, but I'm just showing you. And then uh, I can show, like, which branch I want. So, um, you know, so as you can see, I'm just building it out of... Uh, Something isn't right because uh, okay. Oh, that's the problem, okay. 
So you push the branch, right? And then it'll create that here. So it created a new pull uh, here. Oops. So there's a cover letter and you can describe your change here, whatever you want to say, right? And then here is the patch that we were just showing, right? So you can do it this way. So uh, a lot of maintainers, they will look at the contrib repo, right? And uh, they, they so now you will see that this branch appears here and it's on the top of it. Oops. Okay, so it hasn't uh, updated it. It will take probably a little bit there because I just rebased it. Um, but that's another way and then once it's done you edited it you can say script send pull request right and minus all minus p and then the name of the pool that is there right we create it and it, it will be up there so so basically that's uh, the process you know you could follow either of those depending upon what you want to do um effective so uh, moving on, so customizing a disk drive, I just wanted to cite an example, right? So we all don't have to use Pocky. Pocky is just an example. So it's a reference distribution, you know, it's tested uh, and all those things. However, it has tested a good set, right? So you might want to take advantage of that. So I'm just showing you an example here actually which is again from one of our reference distributions called Pocky LSB and I've highlighted the you know the few lines above there as you can see what it is doing is it's actually taking all the distro policies from Pocky and then it is adding on top of that see yeah, it's saying I want to build that security flags on and my distro name should be different the override should have Linux STD base in it and blah 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 and then you know the feature the list goes on so when you are putting together your own distros this is the way to go don't create your own, own shebang there's no need to do that you know it's, it's a well-tested set start from an offset it's easy i know that there are historically other distributions and i maintain one of those but even in there we try to get as close as we can, all right? So even in there, we have some includes and things like that to just abstract this out. However, if you're building your new distro out of the Yakta project, then I think this is the quickest and fastest way for you to come up with your own distro. What it gives you is um, your control set, right? The changes that you have, you want. And then you know that you are building on top of the tested distro. So that's very, very powerful. So similarly, how to customize a machine. So here I've uh, taken an example from my Odroid layer. Um, same thing. So there exists a machine called Odroid C2. And then I want to create a slight variant of that machine because it's built by a different OEM or in a different software vendor or whatever it could be. So I create a new machine and I inherit the existing machine. So I get all the policies from the existing machine and then I make just the changes. In my case, here in the example, the kernel has to be different and then there are a few other things that have to be different. So we change that. But instead, it's basically taking an existing machine completely. So you know that, you know, that machine has been tested all those machine policies are okay. And then here is your delta on top. So it's very effective. And then you define a new machine. Um, I would recommend that you, know, you go through that um, customization. You just don't do too many customizations. Sometimes they bite, it, they bite back at you and then you, know, you end up uh, days debugging what went wrong. And then you figure out, oops, I forgot to set 
you know, soft family or something like that, you know, some weird kind of thing um, that might be there in the free scale area or whatever. I've done that in the past. So, um, and the, the errors show in a very weird way in some cases, you know, some package fails. You have no idea what's going to drop. And then you start from there, start debugging back, and you're wasting your time bringing up a new machine. So this can get you up on your feet very quickly if you have a new machine. So uh, the next thing I think, uh, yes. So one thing I've been curious about for a little bit, uh, so the comments that have the ampersand prefix, is that something that actually gets first? Is that just a standard like type and uh, name description? Uh, but sometimes it seems like it's basically in the initial configurations. Yeah, so I think. Um, Can you repeat question? Yeah, so um, she's asking about the header that is there in the machine configuration, um, whether you know it has any significance or not. So um, as far as I know, these are parsed by at least if you're using Linux Yacto, so the Linux Yacto kernel tooling. So uh, you can specify here the machine name and all those things, and they translate into branches in there. Right. So, however, that is not only the intention is that if you have consistent naming, then you can write more tools. You know, uh, I mean, you could do that. Mm -hmm. I know we have done it in, in uh, you know, the RDK framework that we uh, we use this information quite a lot, and uh, so we ask all the soft guys to, you know, define this. Right. And uh, so that's basically you know, the information we get. Layering, yeah, yeah, layering max is another one. Okay, cool. Thank you. Cool. So we talked about package feeds this morning in detail, and I, again, I'm giving you a one-page um, thing. So I think you you understood a lot about how it all works. Um, you know, we talked a whole lot about how to set it up, how have signing feeds and stuff. As a developer. Sometimes this is another way that you can uh, set a quick feed up and sometimes it's handy that you can expose your own build your deploy directory and um, uh, your own deploy directory and then you can have your machine booted and then you can start basically applying updates uh, to your image. In some cases I have large images, right? So my image is above 500 meg. And it's not possible for me to flash it for a single change all the time. Um, so this comes handy where you create uh, a package feed that is pointing to your build area. And then you can start up a simple HTTP server. Uh, and I've given that command here. And when you set package feed URIs, it actually tools your package feeds into this uh, particular location in your image. So if you do a OPKG update, then he's going to look at that server. It's already pre-tooled into your image. And uh, and then you can do an OPKG, all, all like, you know, package feed operations. So it's very handy when you are dealing with things like, you know, WebKit and, you know, all those large projects because you don't want to keep flashing your SD card all the time. It takes a whole lot of time to flash those SD cards. Um, so simple three, four, three, three, four ways to kind of set it up is pretty handy. Don't expect you to do it, but it's a um, it's one way of you know doing large developments if you're doing it. Dev tool is handy. Dev tool will do the same thing you know to a certain extent. Uh, this gives you an opportunity to kind of have a way to revert it if you want, right? Because you are doing package management. Dev tool, there is no way to reward that. So overrides, it's done. You have to then manually into it. Um, I think that's all I had. And uh, so I'm up for questions. Any questions? Or if you like to share your own uh, ways, you know, because you're fairly involved in the project at this time. So 
Uh, you know, it would be in benefit of the others in the room if you have some effective, if you have answered your own questions in some good ways, or, you know, or if you have other questions, hey, I need to do this and I don't know, or, you know, I do it this way, is that efficient or is that okay? You know, we can talk about it. Yeah, so um, so I think uh, if you got the question was, um, you know, there's a mix of, you don't want to ship GPL v3 packages as part of your distro policy, but then you want to use it internally to do debugging or other side of things. So um, how do people do it? Like if th there are other ways, if anybody has done it, um, uh, that is the question in general. So the, I give you an opportunity if somebody has solved it in their own way, to share it here. Yeah, so I think the other way that what we do in general is, uh, you know, there's another file you can have, auto.com or site.com in your, in parallel to local.com, which is read by Bitbed. So in some cases, you, I mean, you can have a mechanism like what we use, we use, you know, Android repo tool and uh, you can provide an option to create a development workspace, mm -hmm. which basically internally goes and populates the auto.com with you know, license overrides, okay. right? So from the developer perspective, he's creating a developer workspace. Underneath it's basically within an auto.com with license overrides. You don't do that, that on your production builds, right? right? So that way you're pretty sure that uh, you know it's never gonna make it. And if somebody adds a GPL v3 package as a result to one of the package groups that's gonna ship, then it will fail, it will fail the builds. Mm -hmm. And we have uh, pre-commit builds, which means if you publish a patch to Garrett saying that, hey, here's a patch I want for you to include, it'll fail because the verification build will fail itself, right? So the developer will get notified that no, this is not allowed. So it's only a developer package. So at a large scale, when you have hundreds of developers, this thing works really well because they may not read policy all the time, and you know, so so you enforce it kind of. It's soft enforcement. Well, that makes sense. I think that, I think that's a similar universe, but it's just a little bit more. Yeah, it's just more bit bakish. Mm -hmm. More, more uh, questions uh, or you know issues that you have and you'd like to. Yeah. So, um, Clang actually we have a bug that is open for at least two releases now. We wanted to bring it to core. We haven't yet managed to it. There are a few reasons for that. We have LLVM, LLVM actually just from graphics point of view in the core, but we don't have plan. Um, the reason for that is I think the quality, I wouldn't say quality of Clang itself, but um, the packages, um, there are packages that fail to compile with Clang. So um, in one of these days, we always address this at the very, beginning of the release, you know, how we are looking at it, and then we postpone it or do something. So it's work in progress. However, it has matured quite a lot with 6.0. Right now you will have, uh, you have Clang 6.0 in MetaClan. And uh, so uh, there are a lot of users now, I've learned, uh, they're publishing, I met a few here, you know, they were asking um, difficult questions. <laughs> And, uh, and so I think uh, it's getting there where we might have it as part of core. We can't say when. We just need to make sure that um, it is in a good quality from where you know, we can at least build the supported architectures in the core. Otherwise, publishing a new compiler and not being able to build, you know, it's not a good thing. So there are other parts of Clang like uh, static analyzer and all those things which are pretty interesting. Um, so we might have to have that discussion, you know, where we might just bring it as a static analyzer to things like that. Yeah. If there is no particular bucket, you'll get muscle and make things happen. Yes. And if you do the state of the big world emails, 
the, the key of New York City six machine that's being built that has the most failures is because it's one muscle. And so you know, that's, that's, that's the place where all the muscle failures and that open failure are being caught. Right, right, yeah. And as far as the core is concerned, we keep pretty high quality in the sense that, you know, <laughs> If, you, if you're not using meta embedding, then muscle or GMC doesn't matter. They are pretty much at par. They compile the whole work cleanly. You know, um, but when you extend it to other layers, then the quality is a little varying. So you might have extra failures uh, and uh, things like that. So patches are welcome all the time. You know, whenever you feel, find one package you want to use, and you want to use muscle. More questions or more suggestions or uh, sharing your stories? Uh, is there a way to generate, like we have uh, hosting cache feeds, right? Um, which during development of two auto builders we implement. But uh, we try to use iCloud Cloud. Currently, we are somehow trying to detect whether we are within a network because the paths are invalid for a customer. Is there a way to generate that somehow automatically? Is there a mechanism? Um, yeah, so the question is um, um, we want to have shared state only available internally um, and be disabled for external users. So um, I don't know if there is a better answer, but uh, what we do is uh, we enable it in one of our internal. Um, uh, layers through layer.com. That's what I'm doing. I was wondering if you have any other way to do it. Yeah. Um, the other way is that you need to probably, because um, what happens is it, it'll work, but there's a, there's a timeout. There is a timeout uh, that you have uh, um, with, with fetching, right? So it'll slow down. So you don't want that. In fact, it is not uh, going to cause build failures for someone, but it's just going to delay the build. So, you know, it's better than that. Way. But always welcome to file a ticket. You know, open a open a bug, and we might have discussions on that. Maybe you will provide a override variable of some sort, or maybe reduce the time or things like that. Cool. So I think are we totally out of time? Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.